Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Miranda Cumston. I am one of the editors of the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today as part of this virtual colloquium. Um, first of all, I should uh, declare some interests. So um, I am an editor of the handbook, uh, but we receive no income or royalties from its publication. Um, I should note my affiliations with Monash University and the University of Newcastle, both in Australia. Um, and as for sources of funding for the handbook work itself, there were very many uh, from the very many contributors, but none uh, in particular that were conflicted to report and the interests are declared in each um, specific chapter in relation to its authors and editors. So uh, let's have a look. This is the new handbook uh, we're talking about today. So for those of you who'd like to have a look, it's available free online at handbook.cochrane.org, free to the public there. Um, if anyone is interested in accessing a print edition, it is available to buy uh, from your favourite bookseller. Um, now I should note that this is uh, a major new revision of the handbook. It's reflecting over a decade of development of methods relating to systematic reviews. Uh, it's the second print edition of the handbook, but the sixth version overall, and as well as the seven senior and associate editors named there on the cover, there were over a hundred contributing authors and editors, plus many other acknowledged contributors, uh, peer referees who reviewed a lot of the content of the book, uh, and Cochrane staff, and I really do want to acknowledge Jackie Chandler, Laura Mello and Ella Fleming uh, for their excellent work in supporting getting this book to completion. Um, it's been such a pleasure to work with all of those people over such a number of years. Um, so as I've said, this uh, reflects uh, a decade of development in methods and it is our sort of current consensus, a snapshot of where we think good practice is in terms of systematic reviews of interventions uh, that we hope will be used in Cochrane reviews. Um, but in addition to that, uh, technical aspect of the book. Um, the Cochrane Santiago Colloquium, uh, the theme for that event uh, was embracing diversity and I think it is worth noting not just the methods advances uh, from a technical side but also that theme really gives us an opportunity, it prompts us to consider how the handbook uh, helps bring a lens to our reviews and how we can think about um, its usefulness as guidance to help us um, answer useful questions uh, for um, decision makers, policy, health professionals and the community. Um, and for us that really means producing reviews that ask and answer useful questions. Um, about communities, about interventions. To do that, we really need to consider diverse populations, differences in effects, um, and it also means tackling evidence that isn't always as straightforward as we might like it to be. We know that Cochrane Reviews can improve the way they think through and plan for the evidence that we'll find. Um, and so a lot of work has gone into the handbook to help support that kind of thinking. Um, that can help with particularly complex and interesting questions, um, addressing questions of diversity, but also useful for, we think, every review. So just to orient you a bit to the structure of the handbook, it's divided into four sections. So um, uh, part two is where you will find most of the core methods uh, that you'll be familiar with, but there are a few new chapters in there that I'll uh, get to in just a moment. Part three uh, looks at specific perspectives, so that's where you'll find adverse effects, economic evidence, qualitative evidence, and so on. Um, and the final section, Other Topics, talks about um, variations on the evidence, such as uh, variants on randomised trials, cluster crossover studies. Um, that's where you'll find guidance on non-randomised studies, uh, prospective individual participant data. Um, I do want to particularly make note of part one. Um, a lot of the guidance that's specific to people who are working with Cochrane has now been shifted into that section and for that reason it's uh, now an online only section um, that you won't find in the hardcover of the book. Um, so it does look at some of those process issues and expectations for Cochrane authors. Um, and it also looks at a couple of particularly um, Cochrane specific policy areas. So um, one of those is reporting the review and so we'll look at um, uh, 
why we want to report the review well and particularly look at uh, Cochrane's Messier standards for reporting in there. I should also note that the uh, standards for um, planning and conducting the reviews are integrated throughout the handbook now. Um, also in that online only section is a new chapter on updating the review which reflects um, Cochrane's uh, current updating classification system and the guidance uh, on how and when, um, how we can decide when a review needs updating and how we can go about that. Um, although I should also point out that if you are looking for guidance on updating the review, you might also be interested in some of the guidance on um, evidence surveillance and even uh, living systematic reviews, which appears uh, in a later chapter, chapter 22. Um, but let's have a look at some of the main new chapters in that guidance uh, and see what, what's uh, worth noting in particular. Um, but I, I should note the handbook has been revised from start to finish and so we hope that even most experienced authors um, will find something new in there that will help um, you know, nudge them, give them an idea for how they can improve their own practice um, and some new ideas on uh, new options, new technologies, new strategies we can use to make our reviews as good as they can be. So um, one of the, the key themes for things that have been updated in the handbook is uh, thinking about the questions you want to ask. Um, chapters two and three are really focused on that question of, you know, are we asking the questions that are important to our end users of the review? And how do we really think that through and plan it at the protocol stage? And so there's quite a lot of extended new guidance on that um, that you won't have seen before. Um, one of the key concepts that's been introduced there is this uh, idea of PICO being addressed at multiple levels in the review. So we're familiar with the population intervention comparisons and outcomes being specified um, uh, to frame the review and its eligibility criteria, but these chapters now go into quite a bit more detail in thinking through how we classify groupings of populations, interventions and comparators for synthesis within the review. So are we looking at particular groupings of interventions and comparing them to each other separately and have we really defined that well in advance? Um, what are the comparisons that we're going to use? Have we defined our population groups? Um, and so uh, I think we'll find that really useful going forward. Um, there's also the final concept of PICO for the included studies, particularly which really addresses that idea of uh, uh, considering how the included studies PICOs match up with the question we set out to ask in advance. And that'll really help with um, assessing the grade concept of indirectness later on. Um, there's also a lot more guidance about thinking through your outcome measures um, and considering how broader outcome domains might map through to specific outcomes or outcome measurement tools um, as the review progresses. So that'll be particularly important for people thinking about areas where there are a lot of outcome measures that you're likely to find, um, but I think that's an area where uh, most reviews could um, perhaps consider doing a bit more to plan and, and uh, specify methods for how we're going to select among multiple outcome measures, time points and so on later in the review. For those who are looking at um, particularly more complex reviews, um, there's chapter 16 which uh, is a brand new chapter thinking about equity and how we can um, perhaps do a better job of, of thinking through how we can um, investigate aspects of equity uh, from Progress Plus or whatever the key elements are that you want to consider in our reviews. Um, chapter 17 is a brand new chapter thinking about intervention complexity and so um, that one really looks through multi-component interventions but also interventions that interact in complex ways with the environment and so on. Um, so that's some uh, really useful new guidance there. Um, another key theme I think for the handbook guidance is, is have we got the right methods in place to answer our questions well? Um, chapter 9 is a brand new chapter on preparing for synthesis um, and uh, I like to think of that one as where the plan meets the data. So having gone to all the trouble of uh, planning our analysis, thinking through those groupings and so on, this new chapter addresses that gap between data collection and running the syntheses. So how do we get that data and get it into the right shape, think about it enough so that we're ready to run the synthesis we've planned.
Um, uh, chapter 11 is a new chapter that looks at network meta-analysis in detail for the first time in the handbook. And chapter 12, for the first time, presents detailed guidance on what we can do, what other methods, options are available in those cases where we can't use meta-analysis, where the data are just not right um, for meta-analysis to go ahead. Um, so I hope you'll have a close look at those chapters. And finally, another key theme for the updated guidance in the handbook is risk of bias. Now, um, a lot of you will be familiar with these tools that I'm mentioning here, but um, it is expanded guidance that brings uh, the handbook up to date with um, Cochrane's various new tools for assessing risk of bias. So the structure of that guidance has also changed. Chapter 7 looks at the principles of bias uh, and has a new section on conflicts of interest. Chapter 8 looks at risk of bias assessment for randomised trials using the ROB2 tool. Uh, chapter 25 is for those of you looking at non-randomised studies, particularly looking at Robin's eye. Um, and chapter 13 replaces the old chapter on reporting bias uh, or publication bias um, and thinks about it using some slightly different terminology, which is thinking about bias due to missing results as distinct from assessing bias in the evidence that we have. And that encompasses both studies that are unpublished or inaccessible as well as selective reporting of particular outcomes. So there's lots in there to have a look at. Um, those are just some highlights. As I said, the Campbell has really been um, uh, upgraded throughout and I just want to acknowledge that you know we're really aware that writing guidance is not the same as implementing it and so um, I know the uh, Cochrane training team are thinking really hard about how to um, update uh, learning materials, how to uh, present more opportunities to learn more about different aspects of the handbook and so I encourage you to have a look at the resources that are on the Cochrane training website um, and to particularly have a look at um, the uh, Cochrane Learning Live webinar series, which will feature a number of um, webinars relevant to different aspects of the handbook, including a seminar, uh, a series coming up on network meta-analysis, which I think will be great. Um, but keep an eye on that for, for future opportunities as well. So just a reminder about um, how to get hold of the handbook. We, we really hope that you'll uh, have a look, that you'll find it useful and use it in your reviews. Um, uh, again, acknowledging that it, it brings together uh, a lot of work by such a lot of people um, and uh, we hope that it will um, help you do uh, uh, a good job of, of the work that you're doing, whether you're an author, an editor or another contributor to Cochrane. So uh, thanks very much from me.